Hi, I'm Bowen Yang, and welcome to Search Party, the podcast, brought to you by iHeartRadio and HBO Max. Think of this as an audio companion to the dark comedy series you can't help but binge watch. You might even be obsessed with the show because the theme of today's podcast is obsession, which is great for me because I am currently obsessed with both of our guests today. We have Search Party co-creator Charles Rogers and actress Shalita Grant, who you know as Dory's lawyer, Cassidy Diamond. We're going to get deep into obsession as well as what makes Cassidy tick. And overall, it's a very good conversation. So let's go. Let's go listen. Come on. Okay, joining me today are two reps from the show. We have Charles Rogers and Shalita Grant. Hi. Hello. 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 Okay, so the theme of today's episode is obsession. Let's kick off the conversation by asking what's a thing you're obsessed with right now? I'll start. Um, You know, I am really excited about Rihanna's Fenty skincare launch. And so I was just watching a bunch of videos of different people sort of trying out the product, commenting on it, reviewing it. And um, so far, the reception has been glowing and positive. So I'm obsessed with the not not the skincare itself, but the sort of meta conversation on the skincare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my obsession currently. Uh, Charles, what about you? That would never be my obsession. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I respect it, though. Um, my God, it's so horrible. But honestly, just Instagram. It's so yeah, yeah. terrible. It's like I'm so I'm the most hooked I've ever been right now. It's it's not good. Well, you're it's not that you, your obsession is with your engagement with it, which I think is very novel and very, very good. And it, it excites people. No, it like that's the healthy. The engagement is like the creative part. It's literally just the like the checking, 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 checking. Like the autopilot clicking is like it's an addiction. Maybe it's addiction, memory. not obsession. I don't know. I don't know oh, what the difference is. But that distinction is something very, to talk about. Something to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Shalita, what about you? What are you obsessed with? Okay. So this is a recent obsession. Yesterday I started looking at um I may destroy you. Oh yes. Wonderful, and wonderful show. I'm obsessed with it because it's the first show that is actually dealing with our sexual boundaries mm. in this sexually liberated place, yeah. which is actually what I want to talk about today. Okay, I want to okay. talk about sex, <laughs> baby. That is that's obsession. Right? That is obsession. I want to talk about some sex, and I will talk about what Charles and SV did. That yeah. was like you guys like captured this thing that is so um, just like it's intrinsic. It's it's very intrinsic to our culture and what we're used to seeing. So we don't really think about it, but it's very uncomfortable and. And Cassidy has a line about it that I actually, in thinking about obsession, I was like, what do I want to talk about obsession? And I was like, I'm going to go uncomfortable. I'm going to go where I'm uncomfortable. And then I did a bunch of research. Wow. That makes me so happy to hear. I mean, if I'm chatting, I want it to be of substance. Or else I'd be like, sorry, darling, I got nothing for you. I'd rather I got nothing hold for it. I think Shalita should host the podcast. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like she's done the work. <laughs> Whoever does the most work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The nasty nerd. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start off this conversation about obsession. I feel like obsession is built into the very first shot of the show, of the entire series, where Dory is kind of staring down this flyer for Chantal. I don't know that maybe I'm just grafting on obsession as a theme onto that sort of moment, but I feel mm-hmm. like it, it it sort of is the spark point for the rest of the series where Dory is like fixated on this image of this person that looks familiar. Oh, where do I know her from? I mean, things just sort of unravel from there. I mean, this obsession is the sort of the the combustion engine for the whole series is uh, runs on obsession. I think is that mm-hmm. fair to say, Charles? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think that what that makes me think about is like, what is the sort of overlap with obsession and projection? Like, I feel like a lot of obsession has to do, for instance. The only show I watch, which is you can go ahead and just kill me after this podcast, is uh, the Real Housewives. <laughs> that's the only oh, yeah, thing. Yes! That's the only thing I can. Yes! And these people 
like literally continue to exist in my brain after f- and I think about them throughout the day as these oh, yeah. fictional people that now live inside my brain and it's I like on some level it's because I think with obsession there's like a lack of resolve like there's something about the lack of resolve in like I'm I will continue to obsess and and they say like in therapy too it's like you continue to live out like trauma patterns and trauma responses and Mm -hmm. like obsessive thinking because there's a lack of resolve around the emotional core of that thing. And I feel like that's kind of like something about projection and being like that, that person isn't finished. That idea is a part of my identity. I want that to be my identity and I'm working through it with this thing. Other thing. I mean, that's, such a good example of um, the housewives because (laughs) these people do like live rent free in all our brains on some level. They are And like how? And how? Because it's like, um, how? but how does that even happen with anybody or or, or in any case where it's like with Dory, like why do you as the creator, as one of the co-creators think that Chantal is able to like kind of penetrate through all these different layers of Dory's psyche? I think that's it's a projection. That I feel like that's yeah, yeah, okay. when that's when Dory is like <clears throat> I want to feel that these these inclinations I have can be validated and that I feel like I'm not good enough or that I'm overlooked like the victimhood aspect of that mm-hmm. she projects onto Chantal <laughs> and yeah. then you know the reality of Chantal is nothing <laughs> like that right. at all. Right. So I I kind of feel like you know and with like I think reality TV weirdly has a special place for that kind of obsession because they are real people. And the fact that you can't go in and you can't fix their problems and you can't look them all in the eye and say, look, you did this and this is because of this and because of this, it's unresolved. Like that energy is like, there's, uh, there's something unresolved in yourself. That's like, I got to resolve them, you know? Wow. Interesting. So what's what's unresolved about Chantal's situation for Dory that she becomes so obsessed? Oh, it's uh, beyond projection, obviously. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But like, what do you think that is? I think it was that Dory had a lot of pain that no one was seeing or she didn't feel was being honored on the level that she was implicitly requesting, like never actually asking for, but being like, I deserved for my pain to be honored in some overt way. And this person symbolized an opportunity to siphon all of that pent up feeling into into her and you know like (laughs) like also claire is such like a doe-eyed you know (laughs) like like little spirit that like you could easily think that that's what she is you know but sure um no she's a brat she's a crazy brat brat. (laughs) so funny i think that's a very good point because i think that what happens over the course of the first season is we're as an audience led to believe that chantal is in danger Dory is so insisted upon that circumstance for Chantal. And then things get inverted by the end where Chantal was never really in danger. She was just chilling out in this house, but that Dory has built up this setting and this environment of danger by the time she and Keith sort of explode in this emotional way. Right. Because Mm -hmm. Keith was sort of obsessed with Dory on some level. Would you say? Yeah. I don't think Keith was like a squeaky clean, um, total innocent like i think he had like he didn't deserve to die but right. he 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 gave her enough reason to feel uncomfortable with him mhm mhm but like what is it about that relationship that like cuz i mean the chemistry reads so naturally between ron and alia um what is is it this like mutual obsession between these two characters that sort of buttress each other up to the point of like total escalation where you know this murder happens. Yeah. And I think that, um, Dory also projects onto Keith. Like she, she sees him as this kind of like adventurous guy who, um, he kind of represents like everything that isn't her friends and her world. Like he's, he's out there doing it. And like, that's kind of like, she's, she's seeking, um, she wants to feel alive. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think she wants to feel alive at, at any cost. And she doesn't uh-huh. know that yet about herself. Um, and 
and Keith, you know, she's like a gorgeous young cool girl and he is kind of a sad sack and she doesn't right. know that yet. So they're both kind of projecting onto each other. And Keith also doesn't know that she's like capable of killing him out of right. <laughs> from spiraling. So it's right. like everyone's sort of just like seeing what they want to see in each other. Totally. Speaking of Dory being this young, hot, cool girl, that sort of gets woven into season three where there's this media obsession with Dory. Mm -hmm. Um this public obsession with Dory as this media figure now. Um, and I kind of feel like that's what motivates Cassidy to represent her maybe. And I think you see some of that subtext in the clip where you first meet Cassidy uh, as an audience. Dory Steve, Cassidy Diamond. And it's an honor to call myself your lawyer. Hi. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks for getting me out of here. Oh my God, that's an incredible handshake. It's firm. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but how old are you? 30 and single. <laughs> okay, so how do we start? Well, the trees have ears, so we don't talk here. So I rented us this luxury SUV. Figured you wanted a touch of glamour after a hard night. Oh, that's nice. Do you do that for all your clients? I plan to. You're my first case. Wow, I had to go back and watch that scene, I think at least three times. I was <laughs> so electrified. I was like, who the hell is this? This is so funny and fun. The wrist, um, the ri it's all in the wrist. It's so much like <laughs> gesticulating, hand acting. Um, Shalita, okay, talk to us about Cassidy, what you were trying to pull off in this first introduction. Um, so I too am inspired by the housewives. And <laughs> yeah, like just these people's, just on just they have zero qualms about the potential humiliation. Um, all they're interested in is the fame. And that is that's like a trying to achieve something. Yeah. Um, and I actually have a lot of, uh, <laughs> You know, I'm a girl in the culture. So, yes, I've made a lot of questionable <laughs> decisions um, when it comes to fashion and hair and makeup um, to try to, you know, fit in, like to let the ladies know, like, I know what's going on. You know what I sure. mean? Like, I'm a part of it. And you look back and you're like, wow, you look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's about like, you know, trying to fit in. So when I was thinking about like, Cassidy as a person and like how she presents in the world like that hunger for fame and the the word like authenticity that's like so buzzy right now like right. you know being being your authentic self and 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 going for the thing that you want uh yeah like yeah that's that's what I wanted to um to highlight with all of her extraness <laughs> I mean it it just all falls in the right place. I mean, all of these things fall in the right place, especially um, in these in these introductory moments with with Cassidy. I feel like there is this subtext in the dialogue of that scene where Cassidy's like, "It's my honor to call myself your lawyer. Call myself your lawyer." Uh, here, you know, here's this card that I got for you. I figured you would want that. You know, there's this like supplicant element to it where she's sycophantic sycophantic yes, because she's a fucking fan just like jumping on what charles said about things being unresolved and about obsession and about that projection there are so many people who want to that want that fame and mm -hmm. so they see opportunity in the most abject places like yeah. a murder trial so people like Cassidy, people like, you know, the girls that show up, you know, all of those people, uh, like to what Charles was saying, like they're projecting their dream of visibility on the, the, these people who have done very questionable, morally questionable things. <laughs> yeah. um, and it makes you wonder, like, what kind of per like how dark how like, but that's a judgment, right? Like, and that's uh -huh. why I wanted to go deeper than just like the first, my first inclination. So on your point, Charles, about things being unresolved. So there is a, a, 
a paraphilia called hybristophilia. It's a paraphilia in which sexual arousal, facilitation, and attainment of orgasm are responsive to and contingent upon being with a partner known to have committed an outrage, cheating, lying, known Mm. infidelities, or crime such as rape or murder. It's so crystal clear to me, obsession. But what is a little more, like, where could I go deeper? And I Mm -hmm. thought about that scene where uh, Cassidy is coaching the parents. There's a knock Mm -hmm. on the door. And there's this girl who knocks on the door with lasagna. And at the end of the scene between um, her and Drew, uh, Cassidy says, Men, uh, women get criticized, men get pastas. Yeah, yeah. And on the surface, it's very like, oh, gender inequality. But I was curious because that scene made me uncomfortable. Like I had a judgment about that girl and the girls that we see on the steps of the courtroom who are interested in Drew in a sexual way, in a romantic way. I was curious about that. So I just typed in, why are women sexually attracted to serial killers? That's what I just typed in. And then Mm. I found hybristophilia. And I was like, Mm. oh, thank you so much, Google. Yeah, just go help me figure it (laughs) out. Because... (laughs) At the bottom of this, a psychologist's theory about the why, right? Like the hybristophilia describes the what, right? This this uh-huh. this feeling, this desire, this need, right? The what. There so are people who it? are trying to understand the why. Mm-hmm. And so a psychological uh, theory is that this is about love avoidance. Because mm-hmm. when you look at the uh, the the attached so this is in attachment theory right so attachment sure. theory is about um is about how we are our dynamics in relationships so a mm-hmm. secure attachment is a, a child who is feels safe in their home and in their bodies and then from there we have a uh, uh, three other uh kinds of attachments and one of those attachments is avoidance right so when you look at the dynamic, like what's actually happening, these women are like, they're like, oh my God, Ted Bundy, right? Oh my God, Ted Bundy. They didn't know who Ted Bundy was until he was known to have committed this crime, right? Mm -hmm. So he went to jail. Like he got time time, like he did life life. But there were still women who were like, I want to be with him and wrote him love letters and and tried to have sexual, uh, uh, a romantic relationship with this man. But there's no, they, these women don't have the ability to consummate these relationships. So going back to Charles's unresolved, like they're, this this love avoidance allows these women to hide why they actually don't have the thing that they say they want, which is a monogamous, committed relationship. They can lie to themselves about why they don't have what they have because Mm. they're like, oh, my love, the person that I want is Ted Bundy who happens to be in jail. But <laughs> love is love. And this feeling is, it, it makes no sense. So that's going into the romanticism, the philosophy of romanticism around love. But like, yeah, this love, it, it makes you do things. And so, yeah, I, I don't want to analyze why I haven't had a stable relationship and why I live the life that I live and why I'm unhappy. I, I don't have to analyze that because I do have love and it's Ted Bundy. He just happens to be in jail right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm putting, I, my repository for my love is to put it in the most unavailable person. Unattainable, unavailable mm-hmm. person. Yes. So it's love avoidance because you say you want love, but you, mm-hmm. you're not actually getting it. But avoidance as attachment is such a weird paradoxical thing. Isn't too. it? Like that's, that's why. Isn't yeah. it? And even with the Ted Bundy stuff, it's like the historical conception still is that, well, Ted Bundy was this handsome guy with like knife skills or whatever. You it's know? so it's, much deeper than that. And that's the thing. Totally. Like when it comes to women, there is there is just this uh, across the board for generations and generations, just this desire to be like, eh, it's whatever. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, she's hysterical. You know, whatever. You know, sure. like there, is, there isn't a desire or a belief that women have wondrous emotional worlds and Mm. there are many reasons why a human being in general do the things that we do like it's Mm. 
it's across the board. After this quick break, we'll continue discussing the theme of obsession in the context of Search Party with Charles Rogers and Shalita Grant. Stick around. On the subject of Cassidy, what do we think is unresolved about her that sort of has her glom on to Dory's case so much? Is it that she's like probably just past the bar like 20 seconds before this scene that we meet her in <laughs> and that she this is her first case and that she like wants to prove seconds. herself? Probably. I don't know. I'm, I'm willing to believe that. What a um, day. My fan theory. <laughs> yeah, what a day. What a day. What an afternoon. And and an SUV rental. Um, <laughs> but I like 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 I wonder what we think that is. Like what like what is unresolved about Cassidy that she would become obsessed with Dory's circumstance. I think that it's an obsession with the need for success and what yeah. success gives you, which is validation and being seen, right? Mm -hmm. And so somebody who's fresh out of law school jumping onto a murder case that's like like <laughs> the sensation of New York City, like that's yeah. like, I mean, you have to wonder, like that's so misguided and we would call that person so naive and she is, she's super naive. So it's like, wow, you there's so much that you don't know, but there is that her desire to be seen. You know, yeah. and I would, I would, I would guess that maybe she wasn't like the best, you know, in law school, but she worked really hard. And I, yeah. and I would guess that she probably has some, uh, you know, shame about the money that she has and about what mm. people think about how she got what she got. So there is a, a, a need to prove to the haters, I guess, prove to, you know, the inner me that you are worthy, that you you know, it's that wrestling with that imposter syndrome of like, you, you're not worthy of your desire and, and her being able to confront that belief that she's not worthy of her desire. She decides to do that from the outside in by seeking this outward validation by winning this case. Like if I win this case, I will be happy. And then I will mm -hmm. show everyone that I am the best. And in the scene following the one that we just saw, um, when they're in the car and Cassidy's walking Dory through her options, she goes, the most attractive option to her <laughs> is to, uh, to plead insanity. <laughs> because she goes, everyone's mentally ill or everyone wants to be mentally ill. But this is the moment where like she's projecting onto Dory this this thing. Isn't yes. She? Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That she wants what she wants, which is to get to to be as flashy and to yeah. be as you know as possible, to be as popular as possible. Right. So this is how we're gonna win. We're gonna win with the people because in Cassidy's mind and Charles and Espy set it up like they have the attention of the people and the ad the admiration of the people. So it's right. like go crazy, bitch! Like let's go <laughs> balls to the wall! Like let's <laughs> do it! Like give it, totally. give them what they want. <laughs> totally. Wow, wow, wow. I really want to dig into this uh, media frame around obsession, and especially with the characters on the show and the difference between the way that the public sees Drew and the public sees Dory. Uh, we talked earlier about the pasta and um, Drew ends up having sex with this juror played by Eudora Peterson um, later on and starkly contrasts with the way that Dory sort of moves through this as a public figure now, right? I mean, it, that's a conscious thing, right, Charles? Yeah, when we were writing it, our original, it was going to be Gory Dory and the cuck killer was going to be the like, the <laughs> idea of it. Uh, I know, very, yeah. like, I'm glad we didn't because it was <laughs> when three years ago <laughs> when we were using that word. Um, right, right. <laughs> I don't think it would have been so timeless. But, uh, it, but then it was like, that's, it's a harder game to play, like the cuck thing, because it's like, what do you do with that? And then the mm. truth of it too, is that it's just not as truthful. Like maybe that's kind of like a moment in time where like there was, you know, that, that theme floating around, but it's, it's not as timeless as like the gender, the way that, you know, like the, whenever you see like people saying like Karens and kins, it's like, don't, just don't say kins. No one is saying kins. Like right, right. you're, you're just trying to make it sound like there's an equal playing field out there right now. Right. And it's just, uh, yeah. 
that's kind Absolutely. of we we wanted there to be like Beatlemania around Drew. Right, because even like, you know, I mean, even with the character of Drew being so sort of uh hapless and kind of whatever, um, I mean, he still becomes the sexual object even even I mean not I was gonna say in spite of like this murder charge, but like kind of paired with that. I mean, it it, it, it sort of like makes sense for somehow to people. Um, mm -hmm. But let's play this clip that Charles, you brought, which is Dory working out on the treadmill next to this woman. Um, it's very, very scary scene, very tense scene. Let's play it. <laughs> I can't believe that. Some people are just plain vile. She's so guilty, don't you think? Uh, I don't know. I've been reading up on it. The DNA is all over the body and she was having an affair with him. That's crazy. Yeah. The only reason she's not already locked up for good is because she's pretty. If I ever met her in real life, I'd spit in her face. You tricked me, you little cum whore. If you don't get out of this gym right now, I will rinse your filthy, shitty little mouth out with dish soap. Okay, I'm gonna leave. I will not work out in a place where little murdering sluts break a sweat. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to leave. It's just it's not working. Get out! Shoo! Oh, shoo, you shoo, you get out, you bitch! Get out! You get out, you little furry whore! You slut! Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And shout out to Ann Carr, who is one of the funniest and best people I've ever known in my life. She's so wow. good. Very, very good. Um, yeah, like let's let's break that down. Um, what was sort of the 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 thrust of that scene for you as as a co-creator, as a writer? That was actually that the middle of the season, like leading up to it was like when we were in the writer's room, it was like, okay, so like mid point in the season, the trial starts. So what happens before then? Like it was a little confused. It was kind of like this could just be like episode two trial starts. You know, it was a little tricky to break. And we were like, okay, we should spend the first half showing how they're becoming famous and how mm -hmm. it's changing their lives. And we this episode actually changed a lot and it's actually one of my favorite episodes in the whole series. I just really like all the scenes in this episode. Um, and there's something about, Oh, well, like we, we wanted there to be paparazzi. And at first it was going to be like the paparazzi wouldn't leave her alone. And then it was like, we actually just need one scene where you see like a person in the world, um, mm -hmm. say all the things that like the world is thinking. Like you just need to see it through the lens of like one character. It is just so unfortunate that like someone like, I mean, and it's, it's such a double, it's a bi-directional thing where it's like, so this person is saying the only reason she's not locked up is because she's pretty. But then mm -hmm. the underbelly of that is that she is being subjected to this wildly gendered, like violent treatment by the public. Mm -hmm. still i mean there's no like there's no, she's not there is no actual re, like reprieve or recourse for dory in in any sort of scenario here like pre-trial during the trial after the verdict it's like she's still gonna be in this w horrid horrid prison cell for the rest of her life just in terms of like the way people perceive her to be. yeah yeah, and I think the reason why we chose to present it that way where it's like a white Brooklyn woman in a gym was mm -hmm. like there's so there's so many moments in Search Party where it like whenever people are being like mean to another person where it's like I'd rather do the version that you're like, oh, weird, than like the version that you're like, of course, of course. like yeah, that's that's the of course because that's exactly how the structures are. Mm -hmm. um, but like the fact that that woman, <laughs> I always think about how strange it is that that this like Williamsburg or wherever <laughs> it's a little undefined. <laughs> I loved it because I I feel like I see that all the time. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. I think about the LA car chases, right? And the why, right? I was I was listening to Charles and you and thinking about that scene. And uh, so LA has it's it 
LA loves their car chases. They love <laughs> them. And so they trend on Twitter, you know, and since the pandemic, it's been pop a lock and LA has been like Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> like twice a week. You got Bonnie and Clyde's, like everybody, wow. like the helicopters, every, then they drive through the hood and everybody's like, hey, you know, whatever. <laughs> But inevitably, in these car chases, there are Samar like citizens who do things like throw things at the car or, uh -huh. you know, or try to get, ram the car. You know, these people mm -hmm. who get involved. And I think about the why. And it's because they want a part of that story. Like they yeah. want to say that I was the guy that said. You know, that lady with the the disappeared kids, she's like, I was the lady that took the photo of her at the rental car agency. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's my part in this story, you know, because, mm -hmm. again, it's just baked into our culture that, right. you know, we all want to be famous. Well, wow, this discussion is great because and it goes back to uh, this woman on the treadmill next to Dory. And it, what connects that and the car chases and all of this is this um vigilante streak that everyone is trying to sort of prove mm -hmm. um, in themselves where they're like, I would have done this. I would do this. I would throw my brick against, uh, I would throw my brick at that car. Yeah. I mean, it's obsession. It's obsession, mm -hmm. but it's insertion too. It's this thing of like, I would get in there. I'm so connected right. to this thing that I know what I would do in that situation so clearly. Um, and then it kind of just, that's a macrocosm for Dory. I mean, for Dory in the very beginning of this whole show, just being like, okay, there's a missing person. It's this acquaintance I made in college. I'm going to insert myself in that. I'm obsessed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put myself in that circumstance. Um, the whole insertion thing is like, it kind of reminds, it kind of, my therapist was saying that a big part of our obsession with death and especially like uh, with, um, not to go too dark, but like suicidal ideation. And like, I I have a lot of obsessive thinking around suicidal ideation that I don't even truly mean. And I'm uh -huh. just, I'm just testing myself constantly to see how much I truly love myself. And it's, it's mm -hmm. an, uh, you know, I'm sorry, this is like too much, but like, um, no, no. it's, it's, uh, it's just a, it's, a lack of resolve around self-love like that's all it is and my therapist was like a big like people's obsession with death is that in a world in a in a in an existence where there's no definition um or clarity that it is it is the most definitive idea we have like death is just like the only definitive part of life um that we have any access to um and so like in a weird similar thing i feel like people are obsessed with inserting themselves in other people's narrative because it's a similar like um seeking to understand your own relationship to whatever the idea is that you're projecting onto them or that you're associating with them it's like i would believe that i'm a hero like in that car chase i am a hero and so i'm going to imagine it and then i'm going to decide that i would do that in that narrative yeah and it's just it's seeking definitive checkpoints and markers and standards about your own existence. Uh, let's move on to this question. Why are people obsessed with Cassidy? There is an obsession with Cassidy, I think. There was a palpable, like, every, there was a moment when everyone sort of keyed into Cassidy. I mean, what 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 is the obsession with Cassidy about? Um, I think about, when I think about Cassidy, maybe I'm coming at it from, like, a queer, white, gay guy perspective yeah but when maybe or maybe definitely i am um but like <laughs> i <laughs> i i think of like um did you guys see judy the judy garland movie yes i personally loved it i'm sure it's a, it was good yeah it's a b minus <laughs> but whatever i liked it um but there's like two gay guys in it and there's a scene that i should not have worked for me but it really did um where they're she, judy realizes how much meaning she brings to them and and how she carried them throughout like really hard moments in their lives mm -hmm, and she, it's mm -hmm. like this wake up call for her where she's like oh my god like i didn't i, I do things i'm not even aware i'm doing and that's her legacy and that's yeah meaningful. yeah it's mm -hmm. like and she doesn't know how to contend with that um and right. it's i really i really love it i think it's really profound in it um and i think there's something particularly about women 
um, where Cassidy is this hyper feminine, but also uh, bold and um, the energy is so self-realized in you, Shalita. Like it's like your energy is so strong and so um, of its own. Like it's so like you're just like a one of a kind person. It's just mm-hmm. really Thanks. you're captivating. Like you're so captivating. Mm-hmm. And and it's like those combinations. It's like there are. I think of I think the archetypal nature of women is like that goddess type of 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 thinking is like so truthful and it's what we are all unable to fully channel and when i think that's why like queer men are obsessed with women and like share or whatever and it's like i want to be able to fully channel without shame what i what what's in me and i think that like i think people like see it in you and what you bring to that performance matched with like all of the idiosyncrasies of the character. And it's just like, I, I see that. I just t- so see it. Oh, shit. That mm. was so nice. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. I love that. There's such, um, I, I think it's the perfect, uh, you know, convergence of like this performance having such a precision to it and being so fun. The writing being so developed and sort of clearly laid out in, in the parameters of the show. And, in terms of the character, she is this compelling character who uh, is one of the few morally centered people on the show. I think, like, and yeah. she's like, and she's yeah. like competent, and she's like good at her job, and like, like the sort of, I would say it it comes as a surprise that she is very good at litigating or or just or just being. Um, in the courtroom. I mean, like, there's there, there's not this level of like, oh wait, she's a bad lawyer. It's like, oh wait, like this person. Um, there's this fun irony and an irony that later on develops into like, oh yeah, of course, like this person like is good at what she does because she is one of the few good people on the show. Characters. Yeah, yeah, and also not to keep talking, but <laughs> also like with people that you, it's interesting, like when you're in a in in a group of people like in a writer's room or that's not the right thing but like whenever you're like around a new group of people you always kind of like are looking for who's the person that you believe in the most mm-hmm. in the group like uh, and you're like okay who's got the right answers and there will be somebody that you're like it's always like at first you think typically it's like at first you think this person has the right answers. And then the longer you stick with them, you're like, actually they don't. And, but yeah, then there's yeah, this yeah. person that you're like, I-, I discounted you. And now I see you're actually the secret star. Like it, people can be both right and wrong. And it's yeah. really hard to express the connective tissue between the right and wrong moments when you're like writing a character. Mm-hmm. But that's why, like Shalita brings like a soul and then it's like, okay, it's all glued, you know? Um, wow. I mean, we can't follow that up with anything. Thank you to my guests, no. Charles Rogers, Shalita Grant. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day, week, month, year. <laughs> Everyone is rightfully obsessed with search party with, with Cassidy, with everybody. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bowen. It was nice thank to you, meet Bowen. you. Thank you, Bowen. Great. Perfect. <laughs> Wow, was that an interesting deep dive into the human psyche or what? Once again, I'd like to thank Charles Rogers and Shalita Grant for joining us and discussing the theme of obsession in Search Party. I think I'm obsessed with that conversation. On a personal note, I just wanted to mention how much I've loved sharing these conversations with you over the last two months as the host of Search Party, the podcast. I'm sorry to say that this is the final episode of the season, but the good news is that season four of Search Party, the show, will be available to stream on HBO Max starting tomorrow, January 14th. So you may want to cancel your plans for the rest of the week, but who am I kidding? You'll probably watch it all in one sitting because I know I will. 
Thanks again to all of our guests, as well as the creative teams at iHeartMedia and HBO Max. We couldn't have done it without you. Search Party, the podcast, is a production of HBO Max and iHeartRadio. It's executive produced by Ethan Fixell, produced and written by Jonah Bayer, written and researched by Marissa Brown, and engineered, edited, and mixed by Matt Stillo. If you haven't already subscribed, rated, or reviewed Search Party, the podcast, please do so on the iHeartRadio app, HBO Max, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might get your podcasts. And don't forget to watch season four of Search Party, premiering January 14th only on HBO Max.